Hello and welcome to News Desk, a weekly conversation that puts you at the very centre. Each week we take a topic that's in the news and with your help, with your comments, with your questions and of course with the help of our special guests, we try to look at it in some depth. My name's Alex Forrest-Whiting. And I'm Michelle Stockman, and I will be paying special attention to your comments, your questions, your takes in the chat. We've already had, since we put up our community post yesterday, more than 800 comments. So we're really excited to look through those, as well as your comments right now in the live chat. So please keep them coming. Yeah, so, and this week we are looking at the subject of Ukraine because there are fears that Ukraine could lose the war against Russia because it basically doesn't have enough military support. At the moment, a 60 billion US aid package is stuck in Washington because of US internal politics. So this is the question that we are asking this week. How can Ukraine hold the line without more military support? That's right. And a lot of you, as I said, have already commented in the community post, uh, people like at Cree 6393, Ukraine has already lost. Nothing aside from direct NATO combat troops will change that. Let's not do that. And I have to say, out of the 800 comments, they really are in that vein that Ukraine really is in a critical way at this point. However, uh, there is some skepticism in the chat. Uh, from at indelible nihilist, the comments here have an uncanny amount of Russian trolls. I mean, who are we to say? We, we don't know what's behind that, but there is some skepticism there about all those um, kind of Ukraine critical vibe comments. But I did manage to cherry pick uh, some comments that are supporting Ukraine, uh, like one from Artura Statkus8613. Please support Ukraina. If not, we will all lose and suffer from Russian fascism, kind of talking about the stakes that are involved. So um, again, please put your comments and your questions in the live chat so that we can post them to our special guests, our experts, who will be coming up. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to finish going around the table and introduce everyone that will be involved today. So we've got Nehal Jory. She works with us in the DW newsroom. I love seeing her work on so our social media channels. She will be basically explaining to us what's going on in Ukraine right now, what's going on with that U.S. aid package. And then across from me, we have Cherry Chan. She will be really in the chat looking at your comments and uh, making sure that we get a sense of what's going on there. And then back in our control room, we have Wade Adams. He is making sure that the lights stay on and yes. also <laughs> that all of you far away are connected to us here, as well as our other special guests, our experts are connected to us here. Yeah, and talking of those experts, we have got two great guests coming up. First of all, we have DW's Ukraine correspondent, um, Nick Connolly. He's in Kyiv. He'll be joining us very shortly. And a little bit later in the stream, we will be speaking to Alexandra Chinchilla, a defense and strategy expert based in Houston, Texas. And she will be discussing in particular that huge uh, military aid package that's stuck uh, in US Congress at the moment, and also looking a, a bit more future about what support uh, Ukraine could get even if they didn't get that aid package. So um, we'll be hearing from her a little bit later. Do please, as Michelle said, if you've got any questions for either Nick uh, or, um, or for Alexandra, do please put them in the chat because it will be absolutely great to be able to put some of them to those guests. Right, and I want to uh, shout out a special welcome to Squire Sun. Uh, he says, I come to DW to avoid US media insanity. Just a <laughs> very weird thing to see here. He was talking about our poll question. He uh, kind of had some uh, criticism of that poll question, which I'll introduce now. So we'd actually like all of you to vote on that. And we welcome your thoughts, your comments, because that helps us uh, be better. And we did have a, a big debate today before we put this together. But our poll question, let me just get that here, is, is U.S. military aid a game changer for Ukraine? Yes, it could turn the war. Uh, it only slows Russia's advance. Or no, Ukraine loses anyway. So please vote. We will have that poll result later in the stream. Yeah, it'd be great to hear what you say about that, even if you don't particularly like uh, the poll questions or uh, the possible answers. Anyway, moving on, let's speak to Nihal now, who is just going to bring us a little bit up to date with what is going on at the moment in Ukraine on the front line. Right. So Russia and Ukraine have been fighting for three years now. I mean, it, it's, the war's entered its third year. It began in February 2022 when Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, at the moment, Russia controls about one-fifth of Ukrainian territory. 
Now, for the last many months, this front line of the war has been static. So it's not really moved in anyone's favor, at least in no major way. And um, to the point that even a Ukrainian commander said that the war is at a stalemate. Um, so let's really take a look at this um, front line, right? Uh, we've got a fantastic map from the Institute of for the, uh, Institute for the Study of War. Um, can we share my screen? Ah, oh, great, fantastic. Um, all I right. love a good map. And, uh, you know, you talk about, as you get this up, as you talk about that Russia controls about one-fifth of Ukraine, if we talk about proportionality, I mean, one-fifth, that's, uh, I researched this a little bit, and that's about the size of Nicaragua in terms right. of real land area. But in terms of proportion, like for me in the U.S., I always compare, well, what does that mean uh, in the U.S.? That's like Russia controls as much as Ukraine as would be like Alaska. Wow. In, in the United States, if we talk wow, about so the, the area, amount. yeah, proportionality, yeah. So go ahead, show us our show us our front line, though. Well, I just want to orient people. So, of course, Ukraine's right in the middle here, right? I'm not yeah. going to draw a perfect outline, but this is sort of what we're looking at. Don't want to go down there. That's Moldova. Um, sorry, I uh, messed that up. Okay, so we're roughly looking at this region, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Um, now, a few details about this. Um, if, we f if you look at the pink, uh, so this red line is the front line of the war. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right here. Um, the regions in pink that are visible are regions controlled by Russia. Mm -hmm. The regions marked in black is territory that Russia controlled even before the invasion in February 2022. So I'm talking about areas like, um, let me just mark it for you. Um, so for instance, uh, Crimea in the south or uh, the Donetsk region in the very east. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, now, coming back to the front line, this is the front line that's been static for several months, but ever since the start of 2024, Russia has been intensifying its attacks. And so, for instance, in April, we saw attacks on um, Kharkiv here, where multiple missiles targeted um, critical energy infrastructure, mm -hmm. and so more than 200,000 people found themselves without power. Yeah, they're saying, like, nearly half the country was without power after right. some of these attacks. Yeah. Yeah. And I just have to deactivate this. Okay. And earlier in February, we had the hard-fought battle for Avdivka, which is about here, just above the Donetsk region. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, Ukrainian forces had to withdraw from the battle in Avdivka because they said they had run out of ammunition. Um, and that really brings us to the point of Ukraine's desperation. Ukraine really needs military support to be able to hold this front line that we've been looking at. Um, and that military support really comes down to the United States because the US has been the biggest supplier of military aid to Ukraine. And President Joe Biden did put forward a new aid package that's worth $60 billion. Um, but the bill that can actually mobilize that aid has been stuck in Congress. And so here's one person um, that perhaps we want to get familiar with. Um, I bet I can guess. I bet I can guess as well. Do you want well. to guess? Yeah. Is it the Speaker? Speaker of the House. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yep. <laughs> can we share my screen, please? Um, so Here that's Mike Johnson. He's right. a Republican and the Speaker of the Law House. And uh, for, um, after several weeks, he's finally agreed to sort of put forth a proposal that uh, talks about, you know, what sort of aid can actually be provided to Ukraine. But he's facing a lot of opposition from ultra-conservative Republicans in the House. So that aid package isn't moving anywhere no. for now. And that's really created this stark contrast where you have US lawmakers bickering over domestic policy, right? and the impact of that on the ground in Ukraine, yeah. where a battered military is trying to fight a war. Mm. Thank yeah. you very much. It's a very good point. And I think an, an excellent point, if you're OK with us, for us to bring in our Ukraine correspondent, Nick Connolly, who is on the ground. He's on the ground in Kyiv. Um, Thanks very much uh, for joining us, Nick. It's always great to see you. And just picking up there on what Nehal was saying um, about, you know, the, the, this desperation. You yourself have just been out filming earlier this week uh, with army engineers who are trying 
to, uh, as I understand it from what you were telling me earlier, try, trying to make the best of um, a very, very difficult situation with the equipment that they have. Can, can you just tell us a little bit about that? Well, exactly, um, and it's good to be here. It was pretty extraordinary. We arrived uh, at this military facility and just saw basically heaps of tangled metal. There was some equipment that had come from the front lines that was in better condition, but lots of uh, equipment where it's not really clear uh, how it ever looked initially. Uh, you can see that it had been hit by let, artillery or something. And let me by, just interrupt um, you. Sorry, let me interrupt you for one second because we've actually got some of those pictures that you sent us a bit earlier. So we just play those as you're talking and describing what we're seeing. These are the pictures from outside. So. Um, yeah, if you could just continue and then we can see. So we're at the moment just seeing some of these battered, I mean, literally um, fragments of um, equipment and, um, and artillery that is outside. I know you can't see this, Nick, so that's why exactly. I'm explaining it. Yeah, and, and, and this is stuff that has come from the front lines. And uh, this was specifically about artillery guns, and these have been provided by Western countries. And they said that basically the peak of resupply was in the end of 22, the beginning of 2023. But basically, since uh, the kind of latter half of last year, they have been seeing that flow basically narrow to a trickle. And rather than waiting for spare parts or even sending stuff to uh, Western countries to be repaired where it could take months, they are basically now salvaging what they can, maybe making out of five or six or even ten uh, kind of ruined, destroyed guns, one that actually works, trying to produce their own spare parts rather than buying them or waiting for them to be supplied from the West. Uh, and you know, one of the, the, the top engineers there told me that sometimes they see one and the same gun come back 10, 12 times within a year. So basically it goes out, it's used for a couple of months, and then it is destroyed or put out of action, comes back. And they can even sometimes, when they see the pictures from the front lines, identify their own bits of welding, the bits of you know, kit that they have repaired themselves and made you know, possible to, to work in. So it's, um, it's you know, a huge struggle, but one way Ukraine is now a lot more self-sufficient than it was. Extraordinary, though, that they can actually identify the, uh, their, the own, their own stuff that they've already, already um, um, you know, try to fix, and here it is back again uh, in their sort of lab of where they're trying to do this. Um, what were they saying to you, I and mean, what was the feeling uh, on the ground with them? I think there was pride that they had got so far, right? This is equipment, this is technology that they hadn't seen before 2022. Back then, Ukraine basically had zero Western technology, and now they're the ones who actually know how this kit works. They said that Western armies are often asking them for advice about how to repair things or how to use stuff, because they've never used it in real conditions. But obviously frustration that the politics in DC has slowed all this down so much. There's you know, a lot of frustration about that. There's also frustration with the way the help is sent, that often they say uh, they get sent screws and very basic stuff that they can make themselves rather than that money being used for the kinds of things that they're not yet able to produce themselves. Um, but I think they don't really have enough time and space, headspace, to kind of get too angry or get too into the politics because they're just working around the clock to make sure this equipment leaves their workshop as quickly as possible to go back to the front lines. Uh, and what is it in particular that they say they really need? But in this case, it's kind of the more high-tech things like the barrels of the guns that so far they're not able to produce themselves. So that's kind of the main focus. They, they, they say, leave the easy stuff to us, the kind of spare parts, the kind of rubber you know, parts that we can produce with you know, Ukrainian equipment with, from Ukrainian producers and just send us the things that really are specialised, that are expensive and that are complex. Um, so there's definitely that sense that it's also a question that Ukraine basically got everyone else's spares, they're kind of, you know, the old stuff that was kind of lying around the, the, the kind of supply uh, chains and they obviously would like to reduce the number of different systems they're having to look after and keep going uh, because right now Ukraine is using just if you look at artillery more than a dozen different systems that's way more than any NATO country because they just got yeah. kind of you know a few dozen from each country. Wow. So Nick I mean you're saying that you've got people willing to put in the hours to scramble together whatever they can uh, to make sure that they're getting weapons back out on the battlefield this can do attitude that you're hearing but are you hearing other things as well in, in terms of the morale that you're seeing from people on the battlefield um, who, who don't have enough uh, weapons to fight with or ammunition to fight with at this point in time? 
Well, obviously, it is disheartening. It is depressing when you are just being outgunned, right? When the Ukrainians left Avdiivka in February of this year, uh, the kind of consensus was that the Russians had outgunned them there five or six to one. So for every shell the Ukrainians were able to fire, the Russians had six more. So the Russians don't even have to be particularly good at their job. They don't have to be accurate. They can just basically fire you know, at will along the front lines and hope that eventually the Ukrainians leave to avoid the kinds of losses that the Russians are seemingly very happy to take. So that is depressing and it is difficult. Um, I think for the most part, when you talk to people, they say carrying on as is is still the least bad option. They don't see any option to kind of freeze this conflict. They say that would just play into Putin's hands and give him time to restock while the West would take its eye even more off the ball and maybe supply Ukraine with even less than it currently has. So uh, it is obviously a phase now where basically that initial adrenaline of the first year or so has worn off and now it's kind of become a grim routine. But obviously there is some, you know, there's greater knowledge, there's greater experience, there is a sense of routine for lots of people. But the big question now is, are you know, Ukraine going to have enough troops on, on, on the battlefield? We've just seen a mobilisation law signed where younger people are going to be called up, people whose medical exemptions would previously have kept them away from the front lines. That's all going to change. So I think the next few months are going to be pretty interesting to see how the society here reacts to all that. Yeah, I mean, we... We're hearing what you have to say. There is some sense in the chat. I was just uh, trying to find this one comment from people like Wayne McFarlane, it's who who kind of have a more pessimistic view. Um, it sounds like it's time to negotiate with Russia or prepare to lose your country. I mean, that's something we're going to talk about later in in our discussion, but um, we want to hear more about what's happening on the battlefield. But there is that sense that yeah, people and, and, feel it's critical. And maybe we can just pick up on that then and, and ask you, Nick, um, about where you, what your sense is of what is going to happen um, in the next few months. I mean, do you think that Russia could make major advances uh, in, in the early summer over the next few months? I would just say to that comment, that is a very clear, I mean, you know, it can be someone's genuine opinion, but it is definitely a narrative that the Russian government is trying to spread. We've heard of conversations that the uh, Russian ambassador to the US has had with, with Elon Musk, for instance, where he's basically uh, suggested that if Ukraine tries to retake Crimea, say that then uh, nuclear weapons would be used. So basically, Russia throughout this conflict has threatened has tried to kind of up the ante and use the threat of nuclear weapons and other kinds of escalation to basically make it, uh, you know, to create a sense that any kind of resistance is, is futile. But we've seen that, you know, in two years of war, the Russians have not used nuclear weapons. They have lost a huge number of troops here. Um, I think that comment is a little uh, drastic. I, I think the Russians can't, you know, we've seen they weren't able when they surprised Ukraine to take the whole country. I think it's, you know, when we talk about what the next few months hold, we need to talk about what does actually victory mean for the Russians or for the Ukrainians, but it's not yeah. as clear as it might seem. Um, in terms of the next few months, I, you know, there are, there's a lot of speculations that the Russians will ramp it up again and maybe early summer we'll see more attacks. But uh, for now, we haven't seen the, any kind of new troop buildups along Ukraine's borders in other places apart from in the east that would really suggest that we're going to see something totally different to what we've been seeing just now. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, it's really interesting to hear from you, particularly as you're so in the thick of it um, and that you've just got back from filming. And it sounds... Did, were we, you do, just asking? we do have one question that just came in for you, Nick. Um, the question is from David Wilson. Uh, how is the Russian attack on the power grid affecting the front lines? Is the effect mostly on civilians and morale, or are the soldiers on the front lines also feeling that? So for now, we're not really seeing much of an impact, right? Because you know, winter is over, it's spring, it's, it's cool and it's rainy, but it's not particularly cold. And it's not kind of high summer where people might want an air conditioner on. So for that sense, you know, you're not seeing major power cuts. Uh, this is something that is a problem for the future, for the next winter, because we know that rebuilding power stations is going to take longer than one summer. It's just not going to be possible. Um, in, so in terms of morale, that's not really translated yet. It's more a question of you know, finding the money and finding some way to rebuild this stuff while Ukraine doesn't really have enough air defences to make sure that Russia doesn't destroy the next power station once it's been rebuilt. So I think that's why you're seeing now a lot of emphasis on getting more air defences, new Patriot uh, air defence system from Germany, to make sure that those attacks at least become a bit more difficult for the Russians to do. Yeah, they've really been asking for those. Yeah, yeah. they have. Um, thanks very much, Nick. You're not going anywhere. <laughs> Please, you have to stay with us. Um, but I would now sure. just like to bring in um, our next guest. Uh, her name is uh, uh, Alexandra Chinchilla. And um, she is a defense and strategy expert, assistant professor at Texas A&M's Bush School 
of Government and Public Service. And uh, there, there you are, Alexandra. Really great to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. And we really appreciate it. We want to uh, talk to you about... Um, two things in particular. Number one, we want to know what's going on with this aid package uh, in the US, which is supposed to be going to Ukraine, worth up to 60 billion US dollars, but um, nothing has materialised yet because of this internal US political fight. And then also, uh, you know, what other options there are for Ukraine. Uh, before we start speaking about that, I just want to play a clip from Ukraine's president, Vladimir Zelensky. Um, he is spelling out the importance of getting that aid package through. Um, let's just listen to what uh, he has to say and then I'd love to get your thoughts on that. We have to tell Congress that if they don't help Ukraine, Ukraine will lose the war. And we need to find a public format for this. If Ukraine loses the war, other states will be attacked and that is a fact. It's a fact. So pretty strong uh, comments there from Zelensky, uh, basically saying that Ukraine could lose the war without that US aid package. Alexandra, what do you think of that? Do you think Ukraine could lose the war if they don't get that support from the US? Well, thank you, Alex. It's a pleasure to be on today. Um, and yes, I do agree. I think the situation is absolutely critical. Um, Zelensky is not underselling the urgency of the situation. I think that's the major issue, is that the United States thinks it has time to debate, um, to get the best possible package. And it's really been six months since we've seen Congress vote on additional aid for Ukraine. So what that means is that right now, Ukraine does not have the ammunition it needs to defend the front line in the Donbass. It doesn't have the air defense systems it needs to protect its cities. So, yes, that's very critical. Um, and we basically can't see the the delay is costing lives um, in Ukraine. And so in, in the long term, um, that really does not look good. So the delay is costing lives, you're saying. Uh, can you just explain in the most basic of terms, please, uh, what is going on in the US and why is this stuck in Congress? Absolutely. So to me, it's mostly about um, internal domestic politics, as you already alluded to, Alex. So we see three things. I think, first of all, Republicans hope that aid to Ukraine can be a bargaining chip for other policies that they want to see, um, like additional um, aid to a more robust U.S. policy on the border. Um, and there's also the Trump factor. He's been really cagey about what he'll do for Ukraine. Um, and that's leading some Republicans to kind of follow the lead and be more reluctant to support it. And lastly, I think that you kind of see this other argument starting to develop where some Republicans are skeptical of Ukraine's ability to win on the battlefield. And so they're thinking that it's no longer in the value proposition for the United States to support Ukraine. Yeah, and just picking up on that, because that does seem to be pretty key, why have Republicans called on Ukraine? What is it that has just changed over the past two years? Because uh, to begin with, every you know the allies were behind Ukraine, and yet now it just doesn't seem to be the case. Absolutely. So, I mean, I, I do see this as being largely a domestic political situation. Um, so what you start to see basically in the fall of 2023 is cooling support among Republicans, the Republican public, for... Um, Ukraine. And I think that's due to just kind of, you know, we hear a lot about war fatigue, but basically, you know, the American public starts to lose interest sometimes when things take a long time to see results. Um, then you have October 7 and the Israel-Gaza war. I think this cannot be um, underestimated, like how much this actually affected public opinion. And then the other thing you see is kind of the election getting underway. So in some, I think it has fairly, it had maybe some roots in what's happening in Ukraine, but in terms of what the average voter is thinking, it's pretty disconnected from that and more connected to U.S. domestic politics. Alexandra, I have um, a comment from um, a viewer right here who has kind of a different take on it. He's actually wondering if it might be partly a military strategy to draw out the conflict against Russia. Angel Esquera says, could the delays over what Ukraine wants from the U.S., um, so why Ukraine got its M1 Abrams tanks and F-16 fighter jets later than when they wanted them, be because the U.S. wishes to slowly weaken Russia? Could that be part of the thinking? 
Yeah, so I, I, I definitely heard that argument from folks before. Um, I don't see a lot of evidence for this. I think that it was the Biden administration being very careful about domestic politics at home mm. um, and also escalation concerns. Um, I think the Biden administration is very worried about the threat of nuclear escalation from Russia, or at least they were in the summer of 2022 when most of these decisions were being made. And that's when you see Russia doing actually a fair amount of nuclear blackmail, so to speak, trying to threaten that kind of escalation to prompt the limited U.S. response. So I don't think it's deliberate. I think it's more a combination of those escalation uh, concerns early on in U.S. support, as well as just kind of figuring out the bureaucracy of moving all that weapons to Ukraine. Like, I cannot underscore enough just how unusual and how difficult it is to do what the United States has done to support Ukraine. Like, the, none of that bureaucracy was in place. We've never seen, basically, I would say since Len Lease in the Second World War, we've never seen this quantity of things moving in this quickly of a timeline. Um, so it, it's, it's unusual. I think more should have been done earlier. Um, but also I wasn't there making those decisions under yeah. those constraints. <laughs> um, I just want to pick up on what you said before about how some Republicans really believe that Ukraine cannot win this war. And certainly from what, um, Michelle was talking about in, in our chat, um, on this stream, there does seem to be a bit of a feeling that Ukraine can't win and that Russia is going to win, um, Whatever happens, um, Nihal, I, I know that you've got um, some information where you can just talk to us about the uh, the comparisons between what Russia has, what Ukraine has. Um, Alexandra, we just bring that up, but it would be really good um, to hear from you about those claims. Can we can we just see? Yeah, sure. If we just can we see, share my screen. Please? Share the screen. I'm hoping you can see this as well, Alexandra. Maybe we just get Nihal oh, to yes. um, explain why we are using this rather than something else. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it was actually pretty difficult finding this information uh, because a lot of news outlets use information from an entity called Global Firepower. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of discussions about that because um, first of all, it's not clear who's behind the website. Uh, it has a lot of interesting information, but who's collating it? Uh, what's the method of collection? Are there any military experts involved who weigh in? None of that was clear. And so we've decided to steer clear of that website. Um, but this information is put together from the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Which is which... where we got the map from to start with. Exactly. Yes, OK. Um, well, the map is from the Institute for the Study of oh, War. Oh, sorry, but... the Institute... OK, yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that was me trying to be linking it all together badly. <laughs> OK, but just tell us what we're seeing then on that. Right, so this is a comparison of a different capaci military capacities in um, Russia and Ukraine, right? So if you just look at... Uh, active personnel, so people actually fighting. Uh, in Russia, that's 1.1 million. You just have to remember that this is Russian fighters in general all over the world. We don't really have a specific number for the ones fighting in Ukraine. Uh, and Ukrainian fighters are down to 500,000, 800,000 perhaps. Um, if you look at the reserves that they can actually call up to boost their military, Russia has another 1.5 million like young men that it could call up and Ukraine has about 300 to 400,000. Then if we take a look at the army, uh, armoured fighting vehicles have, have been really important in this war. Russia has more than 10,700. Ukraine has more than 2,284. Now, a lot of these numbers are written in this sort of vague way because it's very hard to know the exact number of you know, tanks yeah. or equipment when you're in a that war. you have. Mm. Exactly. And artillery, for instance, Russia has uh, 4,397, Ukraine is at 1,639. Um, Surface-to-surface -surface missile launchers are really important. Russia's got more than 200. For Ukraine, we don't even have a number. So let it's me just... just bring Alexandra back in here then. Just hearing those numbers, I mean, those are sort of some of the reasons why uh, people are saying that there's no way that Ukraine can win this war because they are up against so much in Russia. What's your take on that? Yeah, so, um, yeah, this is an argument that's picking up increasing traction. And I think if it was just Ukraine against Russia, yes, the numbers don't look good, but Ukraine is not alone. Ukraine has partners that can support it. Um, and so you kind of see kind of two main arguments. One is that Russia has more manpower than Ukraine and that Ukraine can't possibly get enough to, to deal with that issue. And that is one thing that Ukraine will have to solve on its own because... Um, 
uh, Western troops are not committed to the war. The second piece is kind of this equipment piece. And I see both of them as being solvable issues. So um, with the, the manpower side, it's true that Russia has a population of four times as many, and it can, it can draw on these reserves compared to Ukraine, but also its losses have been a lot higher in the conflict. Based on political scientists who have done a lot of work to kind of fill in some of these gaps in data that we have, the best estimates for the first year of the war were five times the amount of casualties on the Russian side than on the Ukrainian side. Um, and that, you know, you kind of see that change a little bit last year as uh, Ukraine goes on the offensive compared to Russia, which on which is on the defensive. And when you're on the offensive, you're going to take more losses. Um, but Russia, but Ukraine can also, you know, switch back to defending territory that it has. So then those losses will kind of move um more in Russia's favor again, where they, they start taking more casualties. So that issue can be, I, I think Ukraine can can do a lot with what it has and with high quality training from the West as well. Um, the manpower side. On the equipment side, um, again, this is a solvable issue. Um, you can get, if you have the United States and the allies work together to supply the ammunition. Um, this is why I see artillery actually as being the most important piece here, rather than like armored fighting vehicles. Um, we can supply the shells that Ukraine needs. At the end of the day, it is a numbers game, and we have that. We are working on getting our defense industrial base up and running, which incidentally helps the United States and the allies in the long run to be able to produce the things that we need. Um, it makes our long-term deterrence safer. Um, so, you know, we, we, could, we can fix this. And I think when we look at kind of the last critical component, which is resolve, Ukrainians are extremely resolved. Like they want to defend, Nick alluded to this in the beginning, they want to defend their country. They see the, uh, the risk of living, uh, of allowing pieces of territory to come under Russian control. So they are motivated and are doing a lot, even with um, this difficult situation now. Um, but I think it does point to like kind of one last piece is, you know, and hate to be the political scientist here, but like, what is victory really? Yeah. Um, and ultimately, mm. Ukraine gets to decide that. But we can think about what is in U.S. interests to do. And this is where I think we could get a little bit more um, work from the Biden administration, other supporters of Ukraine to communicate um, what we can do on this front, what we want to achieve out of this. Yeah, thank you very much, Alexandra. I'd love to bring Nick in, if, um, Nick, you were listening to that, just to get your take on that whole argument, um, which is that whatever happens, Russia is going to win this. We just heard from Alexandra spelling out why that doesn't have to be the case. And she also added uh, that line that what does victory even look like? And that's what you were alluding to earlier, as in what does winning even mean? So what's your take on that with this growing argument uh, that... Ukraine can't win in the end. Well, I think it's important to stress that Russia isn't a particularly wealthy country. This is an economy that is basically the size of Italy's, so kind of, you know, larger than kind of around the medium kind of bigger U European country, but, you know, pretty tiny if you compare it to the EU's GDP, let alone US GDP. So if you have just the EU and the US and maybe you know, Canada, Japan, a few others helping, that is a very different economic resource base that Ukraine has at its disposal compared to what Russia has. Obviously, for Russia, this war is the number one priority and it's easier to coordinate within an authoritarian country like Russia to kind of set a, a kind of a goal of how many artillery pieces and how many uh, munitions they need to produce, whereas in the EU and other countries, it's all a lot more complicated and Ukraine isn't individually the top priority for lots of Western countries. But I still think that, uh, yeah, this Alexander is right in this. This is not uh, impossible from a Ukrainian point of view. I think it's also important just to stress the huge losses that Russia is taking. I mean, by some estimates, just take Avdiivka, which is a pretty small town, uh, not very far from the front lines uh, that you know they had been stuck behind for the best part of 10 years. Russia, it's estimated, uh, basically sacrificed over 12,000, maybe 13,000 lives plus more uh, wounded. Um, and eventually this is going to start to hurt. For now, we've, we've seen that you know, the Russian government has spread money around, given money to families, tried to recruit people from the poorer regions of Russia, away from the big cities to recruit people from prisons. But that is not you know, an endless resource. The kind of post-Soviet generation that is now fighting, these are pretty small cohorts. You know, the birth rate really plummeted after the Soviet Union ended. So these aren't as big a cohorts as you would have had in the 70s and 80s. Same thing goes for Ukraine, but still, these are not kind of endless human resources. And it's a question of motivation. Right? The Ukrainians, yeah. for the most part, you know, know what they're fighting for. People in Russia don't really understand why it is they're fighting in Luhansk or Donetsk for the most part. 
Yeah, I mean, you say that people in Ukraine know what they're fighting for. They are asking for the ammunition, for the weapons, the air defense systems to do that, to defend their country. Um, and, you know, here um, in the chat, at Squireson says, when we're talking about USAID, uh, it's a great opportunity to modernize our own military while protecting democracy in Europe. Hopefully the House will get their head on straight. Uh, so there is, you know, support out there for this idea we need to stand, uh, uh, in terms of the U.S., we need to stand by Ukraine. But there is that sense we're getting from the battlefield that ammunition is running out, that uh, air, def air defense systems are not enough. Um, you know, I heard... Um, a, a, a Ukrainian uh, a military advisor put it this way. If you've got um, one missile you return for every uh, five that are coming at you, you're in trouble and, and uh, your opponent is attacking you. If um, they're sending 10 for every one that you're sending, then they're going to succeed. So as we're looking out over the next few months, I think we need to think and, and ask what's going to happen next. Yeah, absolutely. But before we start what's going to happen next, I do just want to stick with okay. um, what's going on I know, in, I, in I the want, US. Keep, it's I very exciting. And also we will talk about what, uh, what the other other allies are doing where, where aid is coming from military aid elsewhere apart from the US. We'll talk about that in a moment. But Alexandra, just sticking specifically to the US, um, uh, I would be very interested to know what do Americans now think about Ukraine? Are they behind Ukraine or have they um, moved on and it, it was last year's war? That's a great question, um, and I'm glad you brought this up, Alex, because as I alluded to earlier, in October of 2023, you start to see the split where more the majority of Americans start talking about, uh, particularly Republicans, start saying that the U.S. is supporting giving too much aid to Ukraine. And now that situation has sort of narrowed again where Americans think that uh, many Americans think that the U.S. is giving too little. And if you look at the percentage of Americans that, like, basically – Half and half think that the U.S. is giving too much or giving too little. So you, so in some, like you kind of see I, this I this I sense again that, that maybe we've swung okay. too far to the other side. That this six month delay is too much, and that we need to start supporting Ukraine again. So I think the support is there. Um, mm -hmm. And also, if you look at kind of broader trends of how Americans feel about the United States' role in the world, um, this isol isolationist sentiment that I think some Republicans are picking up on is still the minority. Uh, majorities of Americans think that the United States being involved in Europe um, and trying to see a stable European continent, like what the United States goal has been since the end of the Second World War, um, that support is still there. So I think all of this is going to kind of push in the direction that when Americans realize, oh, Ukraine could actually lose this war um, if we don't support them, I think that um, will lead Americans to, to, to really understand why it's important to keep supporting. Great. Um, I think, Nick, uh, you were hoping to say something then. I just want to say, I just wanted to kind of chime in and say, I think there's a real kind of tendency in this war that when things are too stable and when the Ukrainian army is able to kind of prevent kind of big collapse on the front lines, then everyone thinks, OK, we've done our bit and takes their eye off the ball. So there is a kind of level to which there needs to be another Avdiivka or some kind of problem before that political uh, willingness is there. The same thing with the attacks now on the power grid. Lots of people here saying, had it happened in the middle of winter when people you know, risked freezing in their homes, they were sure that they, the response would have been different and there'd be more patriot systems making their way here to Ukraine. Yeah, good comment. Um, thank you very much. Um, are there any more comments in the chat? I mean, a lot of people want to talk about, so what's next? What could yeah. be the potential options which we for will be Ukraine, talking about, but which we'll talk about. But yeah. before we move on to that, let me speak um, to Cherry, who is... a. Uh, uh, great in the chat because you are talking to people and um, answering questions that we're not getting to. Uh, but I'd love to just get an idea of what, you know, what's standing out for you of what we've been talking about so far with, you know, that this whole idea that um, possibly Ukraine could lose the war against Russia unless they get this military aid that they desperately need from this US package that's stuck in Congress. I mean, like uh, what Michelle was saying, actually many people are uh, looking to other countries um, other than the US, that they want to talk about what other countries can do to support, that we will talk about uh, just in a bit. Um, there are also people who are echoing what uh, Alexandra was saying, um, what, what, what victory really looks like for Ukraine. So some people are actually talking about um, how, how, how does 
how is Ukraine better off to have its 80% of territory um, instead of uh, getting all of its territory back? So there is um, the chat going to this direction as okay. well. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. Well, um, both of you keep us uh, up to date with what everybody's saying. Um, let's move on a little bit then, because we've been alluding to this quite a lot about what else is uh, going on. Um, if you are just joining us, uh, you're watching News Desk, and we are talking about Ukraine and about whether it could lose the war against Russia uh, if it doesn't get this military aid that it's desperate for. It's currently a, a package worth up to 60 billion dollars is currently um, basically snarled up in US Congress because of internal uh, US politics. And we've got with us our DW uh, Ukraine correspondent Nick Connolly and also uh, we have with us from, uh, from Texas, from uh, Houston, Alexandra Chinchilla, who is a defence and strategy analyst. So thank you to both of you for staying with us and for talking about this. Um, Alexandra, you talked about this um, a, a few minutes ago, but um, Ukraine did have the full support of allies um, back in February 2022. Now there are many competing interests, particularly with what happened um, back in October last year in Israel and also what's going on in the Indo-Pacific. Um, let's just listen to a clip now uh, that we uh, have have got uh, ready from Ukraine's foreign minister on this very point, on the point that uh, people have taken their eye off the ball and are not particularly focused on Ukraine. And we see that when allies act as one in a very coordinated way, not a single missile falls on the target, reaches targets. In, in Israel, not a single one. And what everything we are asking from partners, even if you cannot act the way you act in Israel, give us what we need and we will do the rest of the job. So that was uh, Dmitry Kaleba um, referring, of course, to Israel and how most of the drones and missiles that were fired from Iran over the weekend were stopped by both Israel and its allies. So my main question really is, Alexandra, do you think that Ukraine has the same ironclad support from President Biden, as he said last week, um, about Israel and also about allies in the Indo-Pacific, such as Japan? Yeah, so um, so first of all, I think that it's the whole idea of ironclad support is 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 not really there. I mean, you see sometimes exactly what's happening with Ukraine, where domestic politics can really influence, I think, more than they should, um, what U.S. strategic priorities uh, look like. But I do think that that failing to support Ukraine to the level that we need to. Um, does send a negative signal to other allies um, in the Indo-Pacific. Um, I in in uh, January did a trip to Japan actually to talk about with a lot of experts there and and, and folks in government how they're thinking about this, and they are absolutely watching extremely carefully what is happening in Ukraine because they view this as a litmus test for overall levels of U.S. political. Um, uh, whether U.S. domestic politics are functional and about U.S. support for allies. So I think there's more interconnectedness between these sort of things than we think. And this idea that we can just sort of abandon Ukraine, Europe will take care of itself, and we can switch to the Indo-Pacific, I think that's a false choice. Um, what we really need to see, I think, I think what we have seen is that we can give the things to Ukraine, we can continue to do this, it's in our ability to do this, and then as as the foreign minister alluded to, the Ukraine will do the rest itself. So it really is not that costly and it, it's it's very doable. And I think the question that the United States needs to be asking when it comes to, to, to Europe really is how strong does it want Russia to be? Um, and if it is in our interest to have a Russia that is not strong enough to threaten the rest of Europe, then we need to be supporting Ukraine. And so to me, that's, that's the question we need to ask when kind of go back to that what is victory question. Yeah. Um, that I alluded to earlier. That's that's just to go off of that. What is victory question? Um, we have OG Big Meech commenting here that for Ukraine, this is a victory. Do you not understand? They told us we were going to lose Ukraine uh, in 72 hours, they meaning Russia, and it's been two years. So the fact that Ukraine has held out for this long uh, is 
a victory in, in some eyes. And, you know, the great take also says, um, yeah, uh, looking at uh, solutions to help Ukraine, we should give Ukraine all the frozen frozen Russian money, which we'll ah, yes. get into well, in a minute. That, how yeah, how is to an keep them in the fight, point, isn't it? Interesting points. Um, I j just a couple of things that have come up. First of all, um, Nick, I would just really like to get your view on what Kaliba said about give us what we need and we will do the rest of the job. Do you, in your experience of covering Ukraine, living in Ukraine for a long time now, do you think that that resilience? Um, uh, and that fight is very much still there. Yes, I think it's there. Obviously, it is, you know, as I said before, the kind of adrenaline has been replaced by a kind of weary routine. But I don't see that people are seriously thinking about any other kind of option, any kind of deal with the Russians. The kind of pretty widely held consensus here is if you go back to some kind of status quo like you had between 2014 and 2022, when you had you know those troops facing each other in Donbass, when basically Ukraine uh, did nothing to try and get Crimea back, then you know Russia will be back in a few years' time and better prepared. So there is, I think, unless there is some kind of promise that okay, Ukraine doesn't try to recover the rest of its territory, but is given a NATO membership to with security guarantees for the territory it currently holds, without that, I think there's no way where the Ukrainians are going to make uh, you know, Russia's life easier and just allow them to kind of basically dial down their activity here in Ukraine until they have more uh, resources. We've seen Putin basically repeat his initial war aims. There's no sense that Putin now is willing to accept kind of Ukrainian statehood. He's still basically repeatedly saying that this is a country that doesn't you know, deserve to exist, that is a kind of uh, artificial country. And uh, you know, we see all those deaths on the front lines. We've seen lots of cases of prisoners of war being shot by Russian troops. So there isn't a sense somehow that any kind of rapprochement is, is, is even anywhere you know, on the horizon. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to quickly say, when you're talking about um, with Ukraine, yes, it, it, you know, it, it's there, uh, and we talked about it before, um, but they need the support. What is it in particular that Ukraine needs? You did mention the Patriot um, air defence system, for example, but what is it that you are hearing on the ground that, that they are desperate for? So definitely the high-tech uh, kit like the Patriots, um, like the Attackums uh, missiles with the longer range to be able to hit Russia's logistics far behind the front lines to make it harder for Russian troops to push forward in Ukraine. We've also uh, you know, seen the mask for these Taurus missiles from Germany, which are longer range cruise missiles than what, stealth cruise missiles longer range than what Ukraine has currently been given by the, by the UK and France. Um, and basically, you know, they will tell you Right now, we're using up lots of missiles for our air defences to basically intercept missiles, and we should be attacking those Russian military airfields, attacking the planes, because that is a lot more efficient, a lot cheaper, and a lot easier to prevent those planes uh, you know, from even leaving the runway than to try and spend millions of euros trying to intercept cruise missiles, of which Russia is always going to have more. So it's about the long-range capacity to really push the Russian army back out of you know, those kind of expensive planes that the Russians are using currently, push them away from the front lines, and to start attacking targets inside Russia. For now, obviously, the West won't let Ukraine use Western weapons for that. So we've seen those Ukrainian drone attacks up to a thousand kilometers away from the Ukrainian border deep inside Russia. I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Yeah. Nick, I do just have to bring in um, a comment from B.A. Jacobson, who's saying that we are, our discussion is a bit biased here. Um, he says, you know, we can't get away from grappling with the possibility that there is a chance that the front line, the front line could collapse. It's just the truth. Um, so what is your response to that? Like, do you see that happening? And if, if it does happen, what is next for Ukraine? Obviously, that's always a chance, right? In the same way that, you know, the it, late in 2022, we saw the Ukrainians doing the other thing and pushing the Russians back in a hurry. That risk is always there. Um, there's been a lot of criticism inside Ukraine that the government didn't start building defences behind the front lines until kind of the last six months and was more concerned with trying to push forward rather than holding on to what it currently holds. But for now, we haven't seen that, right? We saw Avdivka in February. We have seen the Russian army move forward incrementally from there, but not you know, huge kind of uh, collapses of the front lines where you have the Ukrainian army running uh, and really having to vacate territory in a hurry, as was the case, for instance, 2014. This is a more uh, you know, well-supplied and better organized army than it was then. That risk is always there. It's just, you know, we haven't seen it. So I think, you know, we haven't seen any real uh, indicators for a likelihood of that happening yet. So um, for now, that's, that's a question of speculation. But that risk is always 
inherent in warfare. Um, but as you know, Alexander said, defending is always a lot easier than attacking. So you need fewer resources, fewer boots on the ground to hold on to what you have. And with some of the tools that Ukraine has been given, like um, kind of cassette bombs, uh, you know, that cluster munitions from the US, it is a lot easier to attack lots of infantry soldiers that are trying to storm your positions. That is something that is comparatively easy to stop happening. Alexandra, I'd love to get your take on that uh, very question that um, uh, was just put to Nick about the risk of the front line collapsing and what happens. Uh, to be very clear, to the extent that there is a risk, it is directly caused by shortages of key ammunition that Ukraine needs to be able to, to defend that territory. So the way to solve that is to send the ammunition so that they can actually defend all of it. The way to kind of think about it is, is if you have a defensive line that isn't covering a certain amount of territory, in order to be able to hold all of that line, you need to have the shells to actually be able to defend it. Um, and that's where Ukraine, I think, is as they're waiting for these new tranches of aid, are, is really getting squeezed because they do not have the ammunition that they need to be able to hold the entire line. Um, but if they get that and they've been working hard on, on developing fortifications, I agree with Nick that um, the switch to going back on the defensive, I think, is much easier here. What Ukraine tried to do in the in the summer uh, was extremely difficult to do a counter offensive against prepared Russian lines with three lines of defenses and Russia having the ammunition to be able to to hold it. Um, once Ukraine shifts on the defensive, that same advantage can be theirs. And you, you talking there about ammunition uh, in particular, um, and we've been talking a lot about the US, we've also talked about how, um, that, that, you know, there's also military aid and other financial aid coming from other allies apart from the US. So let's just move on to that um, and talking particularly about the EU. With ammunition, for example, there has been this um, idea that's come um, from various countries such as the Czech Republic to, to almost be the, 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 the centre, the focal point for getting this ammunition for Ukraine and being able to, to hand it over in some form. Can you tell us anything about that? Absolutely. So um, the the uh, the allied support for Ukraine has been an incredible example of burden sharing, where you see European uh, states providing a lot of support to Ukraine. It's not just the United States doing this alone. And actually, if you look at like the total sum of, of money, uh, the EU countries have sent around, have committed around $144 billion to U.S. $67 billion since as of January of this year. And we've got... So a, you really see a huge... Yeah, we've got... Sorry, we, we, we're able now, I think, just to put up a graphic to, to show that, to exactly what you're talking absolutely. about. Absolutely. Oh, this is great um, to have this to go off of. So as you can see, kind of the blue part there is the financial support. Um, the red part is the military support. And this is where the United States is just pro providing the predominant amount. Um, and the reason for that is simple. The United States has a very large military that has fought in a lot of places around the world, a huge defense industrial base. Um, and it had those stockpiles available to provide to Ukraine. So what Europe has been trying to do is increase its capacity to produce um, these critical systems like the, the ammunition that Ukraine needs, as well as out, uh, as well as resourcing it from all around the world. So what the Czech Republic has been doing is essentially buying from countries that don't necessarily want to directly sell to Ukraine, but are willing to sell to the Czech Republic, a third party. Um, and they've worked together to raise almost a million shells to send to Ukraine, which is great. Um, but the problem is, is that all of these things are not enough in the short term, um, that this increase in capacity on the European side is not going to really happen um, as quickly as Ukraine needs it. So that's why you need the U.S. basically to send more out of its stockpiles now. And we also need to pay for the ability to replace the shells that have already been sent to Ukraine and all the other systems that have already been sent to Ukraine. Um, so that's why, why the U.S. needs to do it now. So what people have said, um, and one of the stats I've heard on this, is that Europeans would basically have to double the pace and double the amount of support to actually meet Ukraine's needs. So it's clear that they can't do that on their own. And from the U.S. side, it's not even clear that we want um, Europe to, to be carrying all of this burden, because what it does is it comes out of the capacity of European states to defend themselves. So Denmark, for example, has like pledged all of its um, all of its artillery shells like to to Ukraine. Um, 
which is, you know, then that that ends up being a country without that capacity. So one way or the other, the U.S. is going to have to produce the shells and send it to somebody, whether it's the European countries or or Ukraine is really the question here. I just want to quickly say that that goes to answer a couple comments from our audience. At Concerned Rabbit said, Europe can supply the weapons needed. Gumby7919 says, why Europeans can't give them money is mind-boggling. So as you just explained there, the Europeans have given money, have given military aid, are working on packages to buy ammunition from non-EU members to give to Ukraine. So definitely that is in the works and has been. Um, Alexandra, our, our question was, how can Ukraine hold the line without more military support? And that is my question that I would love you to finish with. Is it even possible? So I guess I'll be a little bit pessimistic here. And I think without U.S. support, it's going to be really hard to maintain the territory that Ukraine has right now. Um, so even barring kind of these bigger questions of what... Um, a better situation we'd like to get to. I think that it'll be difficult for Ukraine to keep the territory it has now um, without that support from the United States. Um, and so to me, that's that's not a great situation to be in because again, it leads to this, Europe, this Russia that is stronger and able to be a threat, not just to Ukraine, but um, to the rest of Europe as well. Thank you so much for your time, for your comments, for your insights. We are so grateful that you ha have spent what, 50 minutes or so with us. Really, really grateful. We know that you're very, very busy. Uh, we will let you go. Um, it's only the start of your day, so hopefully you've got plenty more to be getting on with. But Alexandra Chinchilla, uh, thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to speaking to you again. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. And we've still got Nick Connolly with us. And I would just love to um, pick up on a couple of things, Nick. Um, you said a little bit earlier that if uh, Ukraine doesn't get what it needs, it will start taking more drastic action. And you were referring to sending drones deep into Russia. Uh, is that what, what you think could happen if this military support doesn't come to fruition? Well, definitely, it's already happening. Uh, what we could see more of is more attacks on Russian oil facilities. That, that kind of rationale is to deprive Russia of the export dollars that it's making from its energy exports to try and you know, hope that that then impacts the military's ability to fight. We know that the US administration isn't happy about that because they're scared that that will cause uh, you know, higher oil prices, higher petrol prices for US consumers ahead of an election. So you know, I guess there is less leverage there for the US side if they're not sending the equipment that Ukraine needs. Um, and you know, I, I think we're going to see all kinds of kind of unconventional asymmetrical attempts to try and even out the battlefield when you have Russia with so many more of the conventional resources. Um, I think it's also important to say that you know, at this point, the Ukrainians don't really care if this is a loan, right? We've seen Republican lawmakers in, the, in, in DC saying, oh, we'll send money to Ukraine, but not as a gift, not as a grant, but as some kind of long-term loan, mm -hmm. use the Lend-Lease program. At this point, the Ukrainians don't care if it's a 30-year loan. That's a problem for the future. They just want to see those weapons here. So I think lots of people here aren't particularly concerned about what form those, those deliveries would take. And, of course, also, um, it was a question that came out earlier, um, talk about those frozen Russian assets being used to help Ukraine. Well, exactly. I mean, if you just look at the numbers, so we're talking about 60 billion that are stuck now in uh, D.C., versus about $300 billion or euros of Russian sovereign assets that are frozen in Western countries. Um, and there is obviously a huge uh, fear in the Western countries that if they end up confiscating those assets to pay reparations to Ukraine, which Ukraine could use for weapons, that that will be a precedent that would damage the Western banking system and encourage people from third countries to, to park their money in Singapore or in the Emirates or in other non-Western markets. But certainly the Ukrainians are saying that money is there. You don't need to give it to us. You don't need to use your taxpayers' money for that. It's it's there. We have the damage done by Russia here. So just give us what, you know, what we deserve as the victims of Russia's war. Okay. We uh, also have some users just looking ahead in the months ahead. You know, there's some rumors that um, Russia may be thinking of a summer offensive and a key point uh, maybe has some yar. Uh, what are you hearing there in Ukraine about how crucial uh, that is in terms of the Ukraine front line? 
So that's kind of the next logical step after Avdiivka, after Bakhmut last year. That is a city also that has kind of geographically uh, convenient location to defend the western part of Donetsk region, which is still controlled by Ukraine. And so we certainly see the Russian intention to push there. So far, it's pretty slow. So far, the Ukrainians are able to hold it back. But obviously, the same calculation might come as with Avdiivka. Is it worth investing lives and resources in holding that town? I think for now, Chesivyar is seen as more important for Ukraine to hold than was the case with Avdiivka, because basically, once Chesivyar were to fall, it's going to be very difficult in places like Kramatorsk and Pakrovsk, which are the logistics hubs. So you know, Ukraine there it does have a serious challenge ahead of it. Uh, and you know, we are seeing reports of defences being built, but how far, how successful they're being, we, we can't know. I'm, I'm off to the front lines next week, so hopefully I'll have more answers when I've seen it myself. I was hoping that we could maybe find it on the map. But, we do. Um, oh, we do. We do. Yeah. Just um, quickly, because we um, always nice to see where these places are. Uh, if we just share the screen. And it's quite tiny, but just if you are here. And the best way to find is to sort of look for Bakhmut and then... OK, you know, so it's very close there. Nick, I don't know if you can see that, but we're just highlighting where it is on our map of Ukraine. Um, thank you very much, Nick. Before you, we, we let you disappear, uh, because it's always so good to have you and to talk um, to you, because uh, you're such a fountain of knowledge of, of everything that's going on in Ukraine um, and what's going on on the front lines. Um, and you've said that you're going to be going off there next week. Uh, in answer to the question, then, I just asked Alexandra, how can Ukraine hold the line without more military support? Do you think it is possible? I think we might see some kind of tactical, smaller retreats uh, if that American help is delayed for longer. I think the, the big problem in all this is that you know, no one is telling us openly what they have, right? We don't know what's left on the Ukrainian uh, kind of store cupboards, as it were. Um, I think they're being pretty tight-lipped even towards international partners, international militaries. So there is an element to which some of this might be, you know, about really just kind of ramming home the message that Ukraine needs this help, and that's why we've had these pretty stark statements from Zelensky and others. I think we'll have to wait and see how it ends up looking, how many new, fresh troops Russia is willing to commit to pushing forward. I think one thing that for now doesn't look like it's realistic is a new attempt on Kharkiv. There's been a lot of speculation in the Russian press about that. That for now, most analysts think is a kind of information operation to try and force Ukraine to throw troops in the other direction and defend against something that probably won't happen. Uh, we're just seeing a lot more attacks from the sky there, r missiles and glide bombs ha attacking Ukraine's second city. So I think the big expectation is that the, the real difference will be in the east, in the Donetsk region, uh, where we've seen the most of the fighting basically since last summer. OK, Nick, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Please take extra care next week when you're back on the front line and we look forward to seeing your next report. Thank you very much. That's Nick Connolly, our Ukraine correspondent, who's been joining us from Kyiv. Um, what a fascinating conversation. We began talking about a poll uh, which we had put in the chat and, Cherry, hopefully you have the poll question, uh, what the options were and what the results are. Right, so we just closed the poll now. Um, the poll question is, is US military aid a game changer for Ukraine? Um, we've got 412 votes. Um, this poll question and the results, they always surprise me because I feel like the results always come in differently than what people are talking about in the chat. So actually we have uh, almost half, 49% saying that yes, it could turn the war. 28% um, said no, Ukraine loses anyway, and 22% said um, it only shows Russia's, it only slows Russia's advance. Um, yeah, but like with the sense that I get from the chat that is that people feel like um, Ukraine probably doesn't have the chance to win, but then the poll show, show us a different result. Yeah, and then just hearing from, yeah, hearing from, from Nick and Alexandra that um, so much of it seems to be um, based on whether they get this more, the more military support that they're desperately needing. A critical moment. A critical moment. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we thought it was a great chat. Um, well, I did anyway. Did you all think it was a great chat? I hope you did. Um, thank you for joining us and we will uh, see you next week. All right. Yes, we will see you next week. Uh, make sure that you look 24 hours ahead of time for that community post where we will post our question. You can already start commenting right there and we will see you next week, Wednesday. <laughs>